This is Live Well Talk on Lifestyle Changes to Help with Chronic Pain. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unit Point Health, St. Luke's Hospital. For patients who suffer with chronic pain, lifestyle changes can bring about significant improvement. Return to the podcast today uh, to discuss lifestyle changes with chronic pain is Dr. Roman McGee, a physician with St. Luke's Rehabilitation and Pain Center. Dr. McGee, welcome back Thank to the podcast. You're a veteran at this. Thanks for having me back. Well, we're glad to have you back. Yeah. To use the term lifestyle change, you know, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. Uh, it's not a goal, it's a lifestyle. You know, it, it gets thrown around. All, all the time, constantly. You know, and social media has life coaches and, you know, so we hear it a lot. Yeah. But it is important. Um, when we say lifestyle changes, I think people, you, you, you run the risk of them, they quit listening, mm-hmm. right? How, how do you approach those patients when you discuss this? I, I, I like to break it down. Um, I almost don't like using the phrase because it's become such a buzzword. Yeah. And, and we see it interprofessionally too. Uh, patient counseled on uh, lifestyle modifications. And you see, you put a stamp there, we did a good job, that's, yeah. and then you move forward. But did any of it actually cross that barrier between doctor and patient? And, and right. it's unclear. Um, because it's, it's a convenient way of putting a whole breadth of changes of, of actionable things to do. In, in two words, and, and if you just use that buzzword, then none, that doesn't go correct. I don't think that is very effective. Right. Um, and which lifestyle changes are, are pertinent, I think really depends on the patient's story. And that's where I find it useful to get into more than just the medicine, to get more than, you know, if you remember old cards from med school days of onset, location, duration. Right. Um, for that great mnemonic, but getting beyond that of like, you know, what happens? Oh, you've got dogs. What kind of dogs? Oh, you, so, okay, so you will, you will like walking the dogs. Maybe we can maximize that. Maybe that's something we can work on with mobility. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's the, uh, someone else in the family that's been walking the dogs. Maybe the patient that's hurting can use that as an excuse to walk, to get more. And working those things in, but, oh, that matter because maybe just walking isn't exciting for this person, but they do care about their pet enough to help that be a motivating thing. Um, or, or uncovering lost hobbies. Because from, from, you know, from my perspective, I don't really care what it is if I want someone to start moving. But, but they need to start moving. Maybe shed a few pounds. I mean, that's going to help, right? Or, or really just getting their heart rate up and, and getting some extra lubrication to the joints if it's a joint pain. So when you start moving a joint, you get some more synovial fluid there. So that buildup is great. Um, Motion is lotion. That's right. The first yeah. podcast. Uh, so getting, but, you know, I'm not, let's say, I'm, if you don't like biking, why would I counsel someone on starting a bike? When really they, there's someone that really enjoyed swimming. Maybe they were a swimmer in high school or in, you know, in college. And there's something more personal to to be able to restart a hobby that maybe fell by the wayside for a while. I found that the, the dogma or the paradigm of going treating functional pain, meaning rather than say, well, if, is it one or is it a 10, is like meeting with the patient discussing, well, my pain hurts when I walk. Okay, well, then let's work on that so it doesn't hurt when you walk. You know, So the goal is pain-free walking, not get it from an eight to a six. Yeah. You know what I mean? I really like that. Uh, and I know we're all trying to do that uh, because some, I don't know. Sometimes those, the pain score is a little silly, I think, because either patients in pain or they're not. Um, and it's tricky because you know it's so as we talked about in the previous podcast, it's, it's very individual, and one person seven is another person's right. four. Yeah. But um, so it can be helpful to track. I find it helpful if I use it at all is just to figure out what's comfortable because everyone knows the scale, whether they're you know in medicine and out of medicine. Um, so people sometimes will say, oh, my pain's at 12. Like, okay, right. well, so I know you're, I know it's, it's significant. It's significant. Yeah. So what's tolerable? And people will say, oh, well, eight is tolerable. I can live with an eight. I, I can't live with an eight. Right. Um, but if they can, that's great. So it really is just finding a common language. Yep. Absolutely. Otherwise, we run the risk of reinforcing. If you ask every time, hey, what's your pain on a scale of one to 10, one to 10, you, you're reinforcing that, oh, yeah, I'm in pain. Well, let's see, what's the number right now? And it, it's useful because it's the pain's real. But it's also this double-edged sword where you keep reinforcing that the pain's there. Um, and I guess that's a segue and something that I wanted to bring up is there's this trap that I see people fall into that are dealing with pain that's gone on for a long time is that 
it's such a significant part of your day when when you're in pain when your pain's a 15 right whatever you know doesn't make mathematical sense but your pain's a 15 it's really significant and once they're day in and day out it becomes a part of you and after some time some it seems like sometimes people start building an identity around their pain around their medical conditions where i question sometimes and this is again with no blame to anybody i it's almost this natural progression or this risk involved with being in pain for so long is that does this person really want to be rid of their pain because they're tied their, their whole identity around having a condition and having um, associated conditions with it whether it's fibromyalgia or Ehlers-Danlos and again these things are real I don't want to invalidate them by any means but it latches on it becomes more like I'm not someone with fibromyalgia I have fibromyalgia I have these things. In the same way that someone describes themselves, oh, I am a swimmer, I am a, a pianist, I am a, a mathematician, whatever you might be, it's it's tricky because once that thing is part of you, it's a lot harder to cut out. Right. Um, so there's this process of both bringing in other elements to your identity, of remembering, oh, yeah, you know, I, I am an artist. It's been 10 years since I've, you know, since I've painted something, but I can be this thing again. And I'll let those things grow and push fibromyalgia out and rebuild. Your, you have to rebuild in your identity. And that's quite a lot of work from both actually doing it, actually having enough mobility. You know, let's say in your hands, if you're an artist working with OT, to be able to do it with, with where the pain's tolerable, um, to be able to actually physically do it again. And that allows you to, to start forgetting some of the negative things and, and cutting those things out. But it's it's quite a lot of work from the physical, the, the psychological, seeing a therapist and taking some meds, giving yourself those windows of opportunity to, do, to actually do the things that you want to do to make your life better um, and then simultaneously remove the, the toxic elements from it. You ever see the movie Fight Club? With, yeah. Yeah, where he says, you are not your bowel cancer. You are not your khakis. Yeah. Rob, uh, Brad Pitt's character. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's true that, you know, patients can develop into – breast cancer you know and they're they're just they're no they're a mom with breast cancer you know i i I think that does happen um unintentionally nobody sets out to do that but you're right it can that can develop um and that makes the lifestyle change even harder for for those patients it's it's interesting fight club's an interesting um, parallel because it is a fight right i mean you're fighting with this this external thing that's that's ailing you right and whenever you're you're in your fight you start to identify with well i'm a fighter i'm a survivor i'm you're involved with this. It's hard, um, and it's almost harder to. You've been, you know, you've been waging this war against breast cancer, against fibromyalgia, against whatever the condition is. You're waging it for some for years, oftentimes, and then to to tell yourself, you know, I'm not a soldier. I don't have to be just the fighter in 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 this war in this battle, and then I can be more than that too. Is so incredibly difficult because the fight's not necessarily over, but the way to get out of it is is almost indirect yeah well when as you approach patients for lifestyle changes uh i know this myself you know you you set unrealistic expectations and you set yourself up to fail you know yeah um how, how do you address that how do you um it's 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 giving yourself permission to set smaller goals um, and, and that's really for everyone, even if you're not hurting, really, it just give because we're all working on, I think all of us inherently want to be the best version of ourselves. Right. Um, and giving yourself goals that are, are both approachable and manageable is, is the key. Um, even for, you know, I like, like for running, for example, and if you talk with professional people who are professional or, you know, or semi-professional, really active runners, they, in, in their terminology, they're not working out every day. They're running every day, but maybe 20% tops of those workouts are are workouts um, in, in the, I think, in the traditional sense or in their sense of the word. Meaning so the majority, 80% or so of those of those runs are easy runs. They're runs that take no effort. You're just going outside, getting your heart rate up a little bit. But but it's not, but, but you can do it again the next day. You're not, it's not so intense that you're panting and out of breath and like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm laid out for a day or two or three or four a week. It's, it's just enough effort to, to do a little more than just sitting. 
um, but you're going out there, and then every so often they'll do a workout. And and this is this is for you know kind of the more intense athlete, but I think that applies to all walks of life, where it doesn't have to be something that you need to be able to come back to it. Right. You know, uh, I have it's it's come to light in medicine, and we've talked about this on other podcasts. You know, but you know if you're if you weigh 400 pounds, you're morbidly obese, you're overweight, you have sleep apnea, you have diabetes. But for you, if you could just lose 35 or yeah. 40 pounds, you might get off your diabetic medications. Yeah. Because everybody kind of has that set point. And I think that's so important to set expectations to say, look, you can enhance the quality of your life by losing 35 pounds. You don't have to lose 250, right? And then you just start these smaller steps. I, I, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. And yeah. And because the more times you you win, the more times you reach that goal and you, and you, you hit your your bench, you know, your benchmark, you hit whatever you wanted to hit. Each time you give yourself that success, that becomes the little dopamine rush. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. oh, I did it. I felt good. I, I hit yeah, my goal. Small goal. And so the more times you reward yourself with that, the more likely you are to actually succeed in the greater goal. You know, if you're 400 pounds, ideally, you know, the ideal within your know, BMI or whatever, maybe this person should be in you know in quotes at 165 to be at a, ultimately, right? But you're not going to lose 300 pounds in a day. No. Or 200. Um, you, like you said, losing 35 pounds is still a win. Yeah. Losing 10 pounds is a win if we're yeah. being real. Yeah. Or if you're a smoker, you know, if, if you, or I shouldn't say you're a smoker, if you're some, if someone that's smoking, right? The, the identity thing. Um, cutting, down, cutting down is a win. Going from, from a pack a day to, to half a pack, is still significant. That's still a lot less, a lot less nicotine, a lot less nicotine byproducts and smoking byproducts that you're putting into yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's so true. Um, and I, I think the con- the consistency, you know, yeah. um, the the one that cracks me up or always makes me smirk is you you're on a you've made a lifestyle change as far as your diet, and then you have a cookie so then you go off your diet the rest of the day i'll start tomorrow yeah you know I, and i always tell patients like if you drop your cell phone do you jump up and down on it or do you pick it up you know you you you, you just because you had that one fallback doesn't mean it's over yeah. and i think that's where you said set realistic goals and because it's because it comes down to rewards right you failed during your goal right and, and sorry that's a hard word to hear oh, i failed yeah right i i, I didn't do the thing so i'm but i, I want to feel good. I don't want this day to, to just stink. So I'm going to eat that, you know, in a couple extra cookies because that's what was making me feel good before I started back right. yeah. on trying to exercise more. And then you just fall back into that rut. You just, we just took the wrong, you just turned around in your road essentially yeah. because you, you, the, really the, the overarching goal is to re, to change your reward mechanism that you're set up for yourself to something that's ultimately benefiting you instead of hurting you. All right. That's, I right. can, so, I can, translate that you know and think about that changing reward system so it's a, a benefit instead yeah. of a harm exactly so uh yeah i like that and these are things that put you back, in, back in control you know i sometimes i'll i'll meet people who have been whether it's in pain or or whatnot for, for a really long time and after talking for for a while with the with these patients it it's it, i get the sense that this patient this pair of these people feel like they're really not in control of what's happening to them. These are all these things that, these are, that are happening to me. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in, the, the things that are outside yourself, the pains, the, whether it's, you know, the, the weight, the arthritis, all the things that are more, you know, more, more than your own personality, more than your, your soul, your spirit, um, they're all happening to you. And people come just feeling really beat down. And nothing of what they, they say or they vent really has a sense of well, like, oh, I did this. I, and and that's where this reward system, kind of uh, mental model, really is helpful because that's starting to give yourself this internal locus of control. Well, I said I gave myself a goal, and I did it. As opposed to oh well, I you know I feel fat. I'm hurting. You know, even my hair hurts somehow. I can't explain it. There's, and, and, but those are all things that are outside of you. So whether it's setting myself a goal or, you know, I planted a garden. So I'm not, I'm not responsible for something else, for something else that's alive, right? The cactus on my windowsill. But now you're in control of something and you're able to 
get, being able to give back or give to, to something else or somebody else starts giving you this sense of agency. And I think that's a really great starting point for taking your life back, for forgetting your life back. Yeah, I'm not a botanist, but I don't think it takes a lot of skill to keep a cactus alive, though. You know, of all the things, I, I, I won't say I'm a botanist, botanist either. I like having plants in and around the house. Cactuses can be hard because you don't because you don't water them all the time. Okay, and I'll, like it's, I think it's easy. At least for me, I think it's easy to forget. All right, you're a believable guy. So I'm going <laughs> to trust you on this, but uh, you know the uh, I think it's the book of Luke, and I think the saying was before even the New Testament: "Physician, heal thyself." Mm-hmm. You know, you need to be healthy and well. To, to make other people well. What do you do to motivate yourself to keep you on track? What, what motivates you? You know, you know, what comes to mind for me is there's, there's a particular poem. I have it pulled up right here. It's called The Archaic Torso of Apollo by Rainier Maria Wilka, uh, Rilke. Um, and this is a translation by, by Stephen Miller from the original German in the 20th century. So I'll just read it here. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit. And yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise the curved breast could not dazzle you, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise the stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast fur, would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star. For here there is no place that does not see you you must change your life. Uh, and, and for a little bit of context, right, I mean, it's describing the narrator of this, of this poem is, is looking at a statue. Um, there's a historical bit of this, too, where, where, the, where the author Rilke was actually given assignments by a mentor to like, go to you know, museums, the zoo, things like that, look and get more visual imagery. So he's looking at the statue of, of a Greek god that's missing a head, missing an arms. It's really just a torso. And he's focusing on the things that are there and the things that are there no longer. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful description of the statue, right? And, and what's very striking, what makes the poem really memorable those, are those last couple of lines, that last line, you must change your life. Um, and and f- for, at least for me, this is one that comes, that comes up a lot. Whenever I'm feeling in a rut or whenever I'm feeling too still, where I feel like I could be doing something more. Um, just because things are, you know, some things might be absent, like this with this, um, with this torso, right? There's, there's things at war, but it's, it's missing. It's, it's not in all of its former glory, right? Some, maybe in sometimes if I feel like I'm hurting or I feel like I've missed, um, you know, just, God, I don't want to get up. I don't want to do anything today. You know, that's definitely not in all formal, you know, glory. I'm not running track meets or anything like that right now. And yet, you must change your life. And, and yet, there's, there's still more that can be done. The, the things that aren't there don't have to not be there. And it's just, it's just this initial spark where I think that's important of just, just get, get up. Once you get up, then you can figure out what to do next. Mm-hmm. What I used to do as, a, as an intern, you know, when it's, can, with schedules particularly busy in medicine, um, I was trying to st- still keep up with working out or just being healthy. So what I would do f- to force myself, to keep myself accountable, I would pack my, instead of using the locker in the resident room, I would, there was a, there was a small gym on the, in the hospital. So I would put my stuff in the locker room gym. Even if I didn't work out the day, and this is what I would tell myself, I don't have to work out today. I don't have to, don't have to get on the treadmill. But I'll just, I'll just have to go to the locker room to get my stuff. And then once I'm there, once I'm in the locker room, I was like, well, I'm already here. I'm not actually in a rush. I have, a few minutes. Maybe I'll just change. I'll, 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 st- I'll walk past the treadmill. Well, then when I'm by the treadmill, okay, well, I'm, al- I'm already here. Let's, let's do a little bit. Let's, let's run for 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 minutes turns into 30, and I'm feeling pretty good. It's not the biggest workout, right? Maybe I'm not right, pushing yeah. myself, but I did it. it. That's kind of what it took, and it's, I feel like I'm tricking myself, but it starts with getting up. Well, I'm already here. So that's, that's some, this mental thing that I would do for myself, too. To, to give myself, a, to give myself, help myself give that extra little push to, to get up off the chair too. To well, move. I think you, that just reinforces that setting the realistic goal for you and accomplishing it. Yeah. And it just builds upon it, yeah. you know, rather than I'm going to go work out for 90 minutes 
you know, some sort of crazy CrossFit routine where we're going to throw tires around or something like that. So, uh, yeah, And the point I'm trying to make, too, is that that goal can change. It doesn't have to be a standard goal. And if that goal is too hard, you can make it a little smaller, make it a little more reachable. Yeah. But the more times you're reaching. You know, because my goal initially was just to, my goal was just to walk into the, into the gym. Yeah. Not even to work out. Once I'm in the gym, that goal is suddenly a little different. I think it can do a little more. Yeah, that's good advice. I like that. So how can a listener dealing with chronic pain get an appointment with you over at uh, the Rehab and Pain Specialist? Real easy. Just um, go on the website. There's the American Rehab, Rehabilitation Medicine um, and St. Luke's University Unity, or St. Luke's Unity Point Hospital. Um, you can give our office a call and make an appointment with myself, Dr. Matthew, or any of the other providers. Excellent. Well, once again, thank you for joining me, Dr. McKeed. Uh, this has been great information. Uh, and once again, this is Dr. Roman McGee, physician with St. Luke's Rehabilitation and Pain Center. For more information, visit unipoint.org. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.